Um, we're going to get that started now. And uh, my colleague Tom is going to be joining me on this session, but he's having some tech issues at the moment, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, but uh, if not, I'll just get us straight into the lunch and live. So um, today we're going to be talking to you about testing and how you can use testing to keep your services relevant and optimised. Um, so just to give you a little introduction, my name's Jana. Um, I'm a user researcher here at the Centre for Digital Public Services. Um, and we've got Tom as well, um, who I think is still sounding a little bit like a Dalek, um, but he's also on the team with me um, as a user researcher as well. So what are we going to be talking to you about today? So like I said, we're going to talk about testing um, and we're going to start with what is testing and, and why it's needed. Um, and then we're going to talk to you a little bit about how we test in user-centered design, um, how you can get started with testing in your organizations, and then we'll have a section for questions at the end. But before we get into the session, um, we've got something for you to do. So um, if you could log on to menti.com and enter the code that's on your screen, there's a little question there around how you currently measure the quality of your service. It'd be really interesting to see your thoughts on that. Just give you a minute to do that. And just to come in here that we have a, a Menti for, for those who prefer to do the Menti in Welsh, which is the top code and the, the top in the bottom code, 13807, that's for English is your preferred language. So yeah, choose and select which Menti you go into there. Thanks, Mike. Brilliant. Yeah, we're starting to get some results through there. I don't know if I can share my screen just to show you everybody, Lise. Here you go, Jana. I don't know if you can see some of those things that are coming through on the screen there. Oh, yeah. OK. Interesting. Customer surveys is a big one. Got some user research and testing there. That's interesting. OK, great. Thank you for answering that. Um, so like I said, the, the first point is going to be around what is testing? So I'll just wait for the switcheroo of the slides. <laughs> so what is testing and why do we need it in our organizations? Well, put simply, testing is the process of testing a service, a product or a prototype on real users. And when you test with users, you can observe firsthand how they use and perceive your new design or your services, and you can get really valuable feedback um, to help you improve and iterate on it. Um, but ultimately, testing is there because it, it can help us uncover problems in the designs of our services or products. It can help us discover any opportunities to improve the design of those products and services. But it also helps us learn about users and their behaviours and their preferences when they start to use our services. Um, so I saw on the Menti that a lot of us use surveys to get feedback, but instead of surveys, you can get a lot more insightful and valuable customer and user feedback by testing. Um, because when you test with users, you can see them firsthand using your service. So instead of respect, uh, asking for their feedback retrospectively from a survey um, where they give you some opinions and they self-report, um, you can see the first-hand feedback when you watch them use your service. Um, so essentially the message is don't listen to what your users want or say, watch what they do. Um, and also when you test, you're seeing how they use your service. So seeing is believing. It can help you suddenly understand how different the user perception is to your own perception of your service because you might think you can easily put yourself in the position of an end user because you know your service so well and you've got a lot of knowledge about your services, but we're not actually representative of our service users and, and the wide variety of people that use our services. So testing with them can be quite a humbling experience. And it's not only valuable to the design process itself, it's a really powerful tool to convert any skeptical stakeholders you have about being user-centric and it can help you champion user-centered working. One of my favorite parts of being a researcher is watching real users test services and, and see how they interact with it. It really helps challenge even your own assumptions that you have. 
Um, and it's even better when you get stakeholders involved in that too, and because nothing is persuasive um, as testing your own users. So my advice is to invite them along to watch testing, um, project team members, any stakeholders, any of your service managers. Um, it's, it can be really, really powerful. Um, there are a few different methodologies that you can use to test. Um, some of these will help you understand perceptions and expectations that customers and users have of your service. Others will help you understand data, such as time taken to complete tasks. We're not going to be going into any of these in specific detail today. Um, that's not the aim of our session, but we are going to be linking some resources for you at the end of the session. Um, so you can look into more of those methods. Um, so the first thing is, how do you test in user design? What's the ways in which, which we test? Well, it's important to test throughout the life cycle of any product or service. Um, although sometimes we know that that isn't always possible in the public sector, but at the very least, we should be testing when we design a new service or a concept. And it is also important to test your existing services to ensure that they're still fit for purpose or when you maybe become aware of any consistent user problems or any complaints. Things you can test are content on a website or existing user journeys. Um, when you test, now it should be done regularly if you're testing your existing services, um, particularly if there is a, you've noticed that there is a need to improve your service. If you work in Agile, you might wanna test uh, an existing service in the discovery phase to help you learn about the problem and generate any ideas for improvement before you move on. Um, but when you're testing new services or products, that's typically done in the alpha, beta and live stage, but you don't have to be working in agile uh, to test. Testing can be done throughout any part of a project and should be done regularly. Um, so the message there is it, it doesn't need to, you don't need to be in a mature agile model. Um, but now I'm gonna to talk to you about how you test new designs and concepts and, and why it's important. So before you launch a new service or a product, you wanna make sure that it works for that user so that you don't spend time and budget launching the wrong thing that will cause problems for users and then you'll have to rework it at a later stage. Um, the aim of testing new services is to understand, does it solve the user's problem exactly as, as planned? And is it user-friendly and intuitive? You really need to find these things out before you spend time and budget developing and launching your final designs. And you can do this through a concept called prototyping. So prototyping and testing goes hand in hand. It's an extremely valuable step in the design thinking process because it puts the user at the heart of the process. And it requires you to test your designs on real users without having to spend that time and, and, and effort on developing the final thing first. During the test phase, you can watch how your target users interact with your prototype, and then you can gather valuable feedback on it. Those insights gathered will then enable you to iterate on your prototype until you get the right thing. The goal when you test uh, prototypes is to gather as much feedback as you possibly can and as early as you possibly can. This helps you to identify any design issues before you get to the expensive part of the process when you reach the final build. It's too late and often too expensive to leave testing until you've built your product or service. So ultimately, be sure to test early and often. Um, so what are prototypes, you might be asking? They're basically a mock-up of an idea and they allow for testing before making them live to public. They'll be based on everything you've learned so far about your users. So anything that you've learned when you've interviewed your users, when you've defined your problem statement, and when you've started coming up with potential solutions. And the whole point in prototypes is that they do not have to be perfect. They can be really quick and rough um, and they can still communicate the idea enough to get feedback on. It's normally best to start testing in low fidelity. So that could be paper um, to make sure that you don't spend lots of time building something that doesn't actually meet a user's need. So for example, if you're recreating your website or creating an app, you can use paper prototypes to walk your team through the steps. We've got a video later that we'll share with you to, for you to watch at your own time, um, which shows an example of a paper prototype. Um, and it's, it's quite an interesting video. Um, but once you've decided on that, um, you can then make a digital version and test that with users. Um, and then finally, you'd have your high fidelity uh, version with the right branding and the right content that you can be confident that, that works for users. Um, 
So what are the benefits of testing new designs and concepts? As I've mentioned, it saves time and money. So by catching errors and usability issues early on, you can ensure that the product that you have is the most user-friendly product it can be. If you skip that testing phase in favor of getting that service or that product developed as soon as possible, you'll end up spending considerable time and budget correcting it post-launch. It also helps you reveal unexpected insights. So no matter how, how thorough your initial user research was, or how convinced you are that you have designed the optimal solution to your user's problem, there's always going to be new insights um, that uh, need to be uncovered. So testing will highlight issues that you might not have noticed otherwise. And it also improves user satisfaction. So user-centered design is all about putting those users first. And by gathering that first-hand user feedback, you can make informed decisions about the design, improving your user satisfaction in the long run. And prototyping and testing will keep you focused on that user at all times. The next part that I want to talk to you about is testing existing services. So it's so easy to think that testing is only done during when designing a new service and that once a service or a product is live that it's done and dusted and you can do a couple of surveys and get satisfaction figures back from that but it's not existing services need continuous maintenance as we know to make sure that it stays up to date and continues to meet users changing needs so you can test services that are live with real users as time progresses and that helps the services continue to evolve so people don't stay the same and neither do the services that they use and the way people use and interact a service is constantly changing. Do you remember Blockbuster? How did this happen? Well, Netflix embraced user thinking and Blockbuster didn't. Blockbuster held fast to its business model, uh, but Netflix took a deep dive into the user journey and learned that users went to Blockbuster stores not because they enjoyed the experience, but because it was the only way for them to watch a new film. They embraced the rise of the internet and the evolving technology to simplify their model and they made it more enjoyable for users. So they applied user-centered design thinking to empathize with customers, recognizing that the only way to remain relevant was to understand what the customer wanted to experience when they were using the service. So I recognize this is an example of like a, of a private commercial business, but us in public sectors organizations, we have to start acting more commercially because of the financial challenges we're all facing. And there's a shift in customer and political expectations. So in the private sector, profit is the measure of, of their value. But in the public sector, money counts and, and we have to be delivering value to our to people that use our service. And they're the ones that are paying for those services through their taxes. So it's really important to make sure that we, we learn from those lessons of Blockbuster and Netflix. Um, so the aims for testing existing services, um, like I said, it can be done in the discovery phase if you're in Agile, and it helps you learn about the problems of an existing service, but you might do it if you're having complaints coming through that you're noticing. So what you want to do is start by defining the problem that you want to work on and then ask, what are users trying to do and what problems or frustrations are they having? Um, so the benefits of testing existing services, it helps keep you optimized and relevant with your service users. I'm going to say something really cheesy now, and I think Rishi Sunak recently said it. Um, you need to avoid being a blockbuster service for Netflix citizens, and, and that's the biggest lesson we need to learn. Continuing to put users at the forefront of researching and testing live services means that no matter how old our services are, and some of them are really old in the public sector, we still need to make sure that they're right and relevant and adapt to the user's needs. It also helps us reveal any unexpected insights. Um, so what you think might be the problem that needs to be solved because that's where the complaints are coming from, you might find that the problem that the user is facing is at a different point in that journey when you watch them use the service. It also improves service quality. Um, so by gathering that first-hand user feedback instead of satisfaction surveys or monitoring your KPIs and SLAs, you can make informed decisions on how to improve the service in the right places, and that'll help um, the user carry out what they're trying to do. So the last part is about how to get started testing your existing services. This is where I was going to be bringing my colleague Tom in, so we'll double check if his tech's working. I don't know whether he can give us a nod or a yes, but if not, I'll take the lead. It's a big moment. Is it working? Oh my god, it sounds like it's working. <laughs> Great. Oh, well. Hand over to Tom. 
Thank you, Yana. And apologise if I sound a bit flustered. I've just spent the best part of the last half hour trying to get my tech to work. Um, but thankfully, I manage. Hallelujah. So, yes, um, I'm going to be looking at um, how you can go about testing your existing services yourself. Um, and hopefully giving you some um, kind of tools and techniques that you can actually find usable and will give you enough your knowledge and confidence to go back to your organizations and be able to start testing your services. Um, the kind of testing method I'm going to focus on is usability testing. Um, the reason for that is that um, it's a great method for testing existing services. Um, and it's fairly straightforward. If you look at the graphic, you can see it requires a facilitator, which can be you or a colleague, a participant who would be a service user, and um, some tasks relating to a specific service you want to test. And all you have to do is observe a participant to try and um, run through those tasks and um, listen to any feedback they have um, to give verbally as well. So um, it, like I said, is quite uh, good for testing existing services, but another good reason for you to be able to roll it out or for me to want to introduce it to you is because in my experience um, the majority of kind of in-house testing I've seen go go on across public sector has been usability testing of sorts on existing existing services so I'm hoping that looking at this will be of most use to you. Um, so as Jan has already showed usability testing as well as other testing um, is great for giving us understanding of how people use our services and products and can be carried um, out on new and existing services. It will help uncover any kind of existing issues, identify opportunities to improve um, and will offer us an opportunity to learn more about user needs and behaviors. Um, usability testing is like I said, fairly straightforward and follows quite a, a linear kind of um, planning and running process, um, which is about five steps. So the first step is deciding what to test. And then the second step, recruit participants. The third step is where you write your task and plan the logistical elements of your testing. The fourth step is then running the testing. And the fifth is analyzing and sharing. And I'm going to go through each one of these in turn in a bit more detail to hopefully be able to give you um, some kind of methods to be able to, to take back with you. Um, just to say at this point that when you get to that end point and you have um, some analyzed, um, some analysis, sorry, that you can use to make improvements to your service, that isn't the end of the process. And in an ideal, ideal world, you get, you go back to step one and you test your service again to make sure that it is meeting needs um, and then down the line to make sure that um, user needs haven't changed to a point where it's no longer meeting needs. So it's a, it's a, it is a continual cycle. Um, so at this point, um, it's important that we recognize that there are barriers. We understand and we recognize that there are barriers that can stop you from testing your services. So in public sector um, specifically, I've heard capacity time and financial constraints being cited quite often as barriers to doing your um, your own testing. Um, there's also the challenge of recruitment. That can be um, tough at times, but please don't let that deter you. Because in public sector, um, we have the added advantage that our colleagues are also service users. So um, we can use that to our advantage. Um, and it is better to do some testing than not to test at all. Um, but just to say, if you do find yourself in this situation, there are networks like the user research um, community of practice we're about to set up that you can turn to to get some support and some insight um, to help you on, on that kind of journey. Um, OK, so looking at that um, kind of pathway of, of steps, the first one is deciding what to test. So you're going to need to want to test and need to want to decide what you want to test and why. And um, to do that, in my experience, I've seen a lot of business need or, or political need be the driver for service review, that kind of thing. But user feedback is the most valuable indicator of whether a service needs to be improved. So ideally, you're going to want your service users to indicate what services you need to be focusing on. 
Um, then we move on to the second step, which is recruitment. Again, in an ideal world, you would test with participants who are real service users, um, but the world isn't always ideal. But you should um, be testing with about five participants um, for every round of testing to uncover the most common problems and opportunities. And the reason for this is that um, statistically speaking, and that as our graph shows, um, if you test with five users, you're likely to uncover around 85% of the unique insight that there is to learn about your, your service or your product. Um, testing with any further individuals gives you increasingly diminished returns. So five is kind of the magic number there. Um, and like I said, if it turns out that you are struggling to recruit uh, citizen service users, then you are able to test with uh, colleagues. There is insight to be gained there, um, but you do need to be quite strict with, with who you recruit in terms of your, your colleagues. Um, and there's a little list there that we'd like you to adhere to if that is something you do do. So we'd like you to recruit people who work in a different service area, who have quite little knowledge about your processes and your service, um, preferably people who work outside of a digital team or service design team and people who aren't familiar with any of the, the kind of in-house service jargon that's used. Um, if you follow those steps, then you're ensuring that the insight you gather is as unbiased as possible and will actually reflect real user need instead of business need. Um, and another point is we'd encourage you to be as diverse and inclusive as possible with your recruitment. Um, this will help uncover any uh, accessibility issues that might exist in the service. So the third step is um, task writing and planning. So writing tasks, um, you will need to, to prepare a set, like a handful really of realistic activities that um, will test the usability of your service and hopefully uncover some really usable insight. When you're writing your tasks, um, you need to be careful of the wording you use. So um, it needs to be easy to follow, but you also need to make sure it's not leading the participants. So for example, um, you wouldn't want to ask um, someone, can you find the council tax reduction form? It would be better to ask, can you show us how you might apply for financial support with your council tax? So it's not pointing them in the direction that they need to go. Then it comes to running the session. So here are some kind of um, pointers to, to help you with the running. Um, Firstly, it's useful to prepare a script um, to keep you on track during the session. So what I mean by this is an outline of what you need to cover during the session. Um, it will involve the um, some of the, the kind of logistical elements of the session, some of the housekeeping elements of the session. It will remind you to um, make sure you gain the participants consent to record their experience. Um, and it will set up the task questions and it, it acts as a useful kind of prompt. Um, then you go through and ask the participants to complete one task at a time and um, you'll want to encourage them to talk you through their, their kind of thought processes and feelings as they're going to be as verbal as possible. Um, but as well as listening to what they're saying, it's more important to really pay quite careful attention to what they're doing because these can sometimes be different. Um, you then watch closely and record what you're seeing and hearing. And um, if you need to, you can ask follow-up questions to help kind of dive in a little deeper um, to their experiences. Remember, it's important to stay neutral as well while you're going through this and not to influence any of your participants' decisions, even if they, they start to get stuck on certain activities. Um, and the final step then, <clears throat> once you've undertaken all your sessions, is to take those findings and analyze them. Um, in doing that, um, it's often useful to begin labeling them in a way that enables you to kind of group and dissect the findings um, in, a, in a really helpful way. One way of doing that perhaps might be labeling the severity of each issue as they come up. So a high, medium, low severity, or the type of issue. So something like unclear content or poor findability. And this will help you kind of prioritize the issues that you really want to tackle first. Um, 
then you're going to want to present these findings back to your team and back to any key decision makers. And it's really powerful at this point um, to show the right people why the, why the service needs to improve and um, the, the evidence you've just built can be a really useful and, and powerful lever for doing that. In doing this, it's worth considering the different ways that you might want to present your findings back to different audiences because presenting back to a team um, is the easy part, but presenting to a senior decision maker perhaps will require a little bit more thought in how you want to present. Um, and finally, as I mentioned before, it's important to remember that the testing cycle doesn't end there. It should be continuous um, and should happen on multiple occasions during the life of a service. Um, like I said, you want to make sure that the changes you've made are the right changes and meet users' needs. But you also want to make sure that as users' needs change over time, that you're continuing to meet them. Um, so that's that. That's hopefully um, a useful whistle-stop tour of how you can use usability testing in your own organizations to improve your services. Um, WLGA Digital team have created a resource um, to go with this and it includes uh, a more detailed description of the kind of steps I've just run through, as well as some useful templates to accompany it. Um, we're going to make this available with the micro skills document that's going to accompany this uh, lunch to learn session. We also have um, a couple of useful videos, which I think you should be able to link to from this slide. If not, they're going to be included in that, um, that uh, document as well. So I'm going to run through a really quick recap then of everything that's been covered um, before we come to uh, time for questions. But um, yeah, so just to say that testing um, with users is a really powerful and important part of user sent design, which is what um, obviously Jana and I are massive advocates of. It's sometimes considered complex and time consuming, but it doesn't always have to be. It's important to consider that if you choose not to involve the end user, it means that you're not gonna get the right insight from the people who are actually going to use your services. Um, when you're designing new concepts, ignoring the user when designing new concepts might lead to increased costs later on, so it's best to test at the beginning. Um, it's likely down the line that the users are gonna find services or products that you've just developed uh, difficult to use and the service may end up needing restructuring. And when you test existing services, instead of using things like satisfaction surveys, something like usability testing I've just shown you, um, and watching how users interact with your service will provide a lot more useful insight um, and lead you to solving the right problems. And finally, like I said, usability testing or any kind of testing in-house is a great way to test your service. Um, and you are able to do this yourself. You don't need to be a user researcher like Yana and I. You have the skills at your own disposal. But if recruitment is proving challenging, then you can test with colleagues because some testing is better than no testing. Um, but if we can help support you in any way, then please do reach out to us. Um, and like I said, we've there'll be more details later, but we're setting up a community of practice that you may want to be a part of if, it, if uh, you're interested in that. So that's enough from me. Um, now back to you. I think we're going to look at the... Um, Menti slide again, and I think there's another question uh, we'd like you to, to answer to, or another couple of questions perhaps, to help us understand if we've been uh, telling you the right stuff during today's presentation. So if you can take, uh, yeah, 30 seconds or a minute just to go and answer those questions, that'd be much appreciated. Brilliant. Thanks, Jana. Thanks, Tom. That was excellent. Um, um, does anyone have any any questions before we start to tell you about what's coming up with the, the lunch and learns? Any questions there for the for Tom and Jana? Like I said, we can we can pick up with Tom and Jana afterwards as well. If anything that pops into your head following this session, I've got your email addresses. So so moving on. 
Um, we just want to let you know that this, um, this Lunch and Learn is a part of a, well, first of all, just a reminder there on screen, as Tom and Jana have both mentioned, we are building you as a research community of practice. So you've got an email address in there. So if you are interested in joining the community of practice, yeah, please get in touch and you'll get in touch with us at user.research at digitalpublicservices.gov.wales and the team will pick that up and we'll be in touch with you as and when that gets started. Um, we also have a number of um, sessions coming up with the Lunch and Learns. As you can see, we've, um, we're two down now. So we've done, we've done a session on how to use research to make improvements to your service. Again, that recording, if you did miss that session, is available on our YouTube channel. Um, we've also got um, ones coming up um, looking at uh, content design. We've got stuff that is looking at accessibility. Lots of sessions coming up for you. Um, I've got some links I can actually po post into um, the chats, but we will post all of those links in any in the follow-up communication emails with yourselves. Um, so we do have yeah, the series of lunch and learns. We also have um, Lean Coffees. Now, I don't know if you are familiar with Lean Coffees, but they are agendaless meetings and a chance to chat about topics you'd like to talk about. So if you have any service design problems or challenges you'd like to discuss in, a, in an open setting with, with like-minded colleagues, then please get yourself along to our Lean Coffees. So we've got another one next Tuesday, um, and then we'll have our third uh, Lunch and Learn the following week. So we really think these Lean Coffees are a really great chance just to, if you've got any questions from anything that's gone on happened today, then pop lunch that Lean Coffee. I think Tom and Yana are gonna be there as well. So um, yeah, do come along. Uh, grab a coffee and and join us there for a, for our next lean coffee. But I think that is how we wrap it up. I will post the chat uh, link now to um, the resources. Again, you will find that the testing um, micro skill resource is now available on our website on our resources section. So please go in there, um, and we look forward to seeing you at our future events. Many thanks. thanks. Thank you. Bye.